We're going to be looking in the book of Jonah this morning, chapter 1. This was the second sermon that I ever preached on radio in 1984, in the fall of 84 when I got into radio. And I called it the reluctant hero. I did a series on heroes in the Bible and my very first one was King David. And then the second one was Jonah. And if I keep grinning, y'all will notice that I'm finding it very hard to concentrate while Shane has a pacifier sticking in his mouth back there. <laughs> You see, y'all don't see what I see. Sometimes one of my sons will sit in the back back there, and one of them got up and did a hillbilly dance all the way in the back of the building, and nobody could see it but me, and they was wondering why I was getting tickled at a serious point of the sermon. But Jonah was a reluctant hero because he knew what God expected of him but he didn't want to do it. Now, there's no doubt people in here and watching by YouTube, Facebook, TV, listening by radio, whatever, you are in that same boat, if you'll pardon the expression. You know what God wants you to do, but you're not willing to do it right now. Uh, Augustine, one of the early church fathers, as many people call him, or really one of the early theologians more so than a church father. He knew all about God. But he had one problem. He was a major womanizer. And he chased after women and prostitutes and all of that, and that, that was his thing. And he actually prayed a prayer, Lord, make me chaste but not yet. What an awful thing to say. Now, when he really got saved, it changed him, made a new creature out of him. He wasn't that anymore. And I like the story about where after he had truly accepted the Lord, he was going down the street one day and a prostitute saw him whom he knew very well. And she kept going, Augustine, it is I. Augustine, it is I. And he ignored her and he kept walking. Till finally she stepped in front of him and said, Augustine, it is I. And he said, yes, but it is not I. When he finally decided to do what God had expected of him, it changed his life. Now there are some of you that are on the fence at, at literally accepting Christ for real as your Lord and Savior. You're on the fence. You know what you need to do, but there's too much <clears throat> distraction over here. And so you're, you're at a, a crossroads right now. May I say that you need to get on board very quickly one way or the other because time truly is running out in this world. If you look at what's going on in the news and you compare it to the prophecies that Jesus gave and many of the prophets gave, time is very short and very precious right now. Many of you are saved and you've known for a long time what God expects of you, but you want to do it your way and you're not willing to make the sacrifice to devote your life to doing what he wants you to do. I will say this to you, if you know the Lord, you will be miserable until you give in and do what he tells you to do. Once you do give in and do what he wants you to do, you'll find it's the most rewarding thing in the world. Will it be tough? Yes. Will it have pitfalls? Yes. Will there be a struggle? Yes. But there's nothing compared to being in the will of God. Nothing at all. I don't care what it is. You may try what the world has to offer, but you're going to need a bigger boost every night and a bigger boost to keep up with that. And eventually you run into the wall. Now here, the, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. 
saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Now Jonah was a preacher, and he said, Go to Nineveh and preach against that city, for their wickedness has come up before me. The city was so big, it had 120,000 children in it. Not to mention the parents and grandparents. 120,000 children. The big problem with Nineveh was they were the sworn enemies of the Jews. They hated the Jews. The Jews hated them. They were so wicked that they took their newborn babies and laid it in the red hot arms of the god Moloch that was heated up till it was red and they would lay their babies in there and sacrifice their newborn babies to a false god. They did all kinds of wicked things. Kind of a whole lot like America right now. Might as well tell it the way it is. I don't think there's any wicked device that we haven't thought of in this country. And not only have we not thought of it, we've paraded it around and glorified it. And now we want everybody to embrace it. We have that shoved down our throat every day. One more wicked thing after another. And now the latest thing is pedophilia. Yeah. They want America to embrace the abuse of little children. They do. And now the social scientists and all are coming up with ways to maneuver that. Have you noticed the way that they've done just since, since the first of this year? How they have taken control of this nation and turned it into a nation full of zombies and glorifying wickedness and all of that. We're getting worse and worse. We're getting close to going out of here. So he told Jonah, go cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Here's the task that he gave Jonah to do. And you know what Jonah did? Like a typical Christian, he rose up to flee under Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You know, there are people today that think they can run from God. I did. From the age of 17 to the age of 27, I thought I could actually run from God and he wouldn't know what I was doing. Boy, did I run. I did this and I did that and all, oh yeah, buddy. And God just sat back and laughed. He knew where I was, what I was doing, the whole time. By the way, God is out of town. You know, some people think, well, I can go to Roanoke and nobody going to know nothing about it. Yeah, God's in Roanoke too. Some of the time he is. <laughs> I don't care where you go, you can't hide from God. He sees everything. He knows you. But you know what the really bizarre thing about all of this is even though God knows you, knows where you are, he still loves you. And he wants to bring you into the fold and change your life. But Jonah thought he could run. And so he, he uh, fled from the presence of the Lord, went to Tarshish, and went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Going to go get away from God. God will let you run for a while. Some of you, he'll let you run for a little bit. Sometimes he'll let you run for a good long while. And eventually he's going to yank back on that rope. And when he does, buddy, your world's coming up under you. I'm, on, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to tell you the way it works. Because I've been there and seen it. And I don't wish it on my worst enemy. You belong, if you belong to him and you're running from him, he'll let you run. But then he's going to yank you right back until you listen. No matter what he has to do to get your attention and pray that he don't have to step the game up for what you're already dealing with right now. But he will because you belong to him. Now, here he's running. And so the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was nearly broken. Man, it was churning, and the boat he was in was just getting ready to fall apart. And the mariners were afraid. Now, he was on board a ship full of pagans that did not know God. And the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man unto his God, whatever it may be. 
and cast forth the, the wares that were in the ship to lighten it. And Jonah had gone down into the side of the ship and he lay down and was fast asleep. Here the ship is going this away and that away and they're dumping this load off the ship to try to lighten it and they're about ready to get broken up and Jonah's down in the hold sleeping. That might be where you are right now. But I'm going to tell you, if you are, God is going to wake you up. Trust me on this, the voice of experience. So the shipmaster came to him and said to him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? I like that. Arise and call upon your God, if it so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. There is a moral to what I just read. Not only are you hurting yourself when you are running from God, but you are hurting everybody around you. And that's the most selfish thing of all. No man sins to himself. There is no such thing as a victimless sin, like they call the victimless crimes. When you start living contrary to the will of God, everybody that you love pays for it. They do. They do. Many of us could come up here and we could be here till 3 o'clock this afternoon telling you of the stupid things we did defying God and what happened to our family and our loved ones as a result of it. We could. And so if you care about the ones you love, you'll listen to this too. Because this is important. This is very, very important. They told him to call on your God. And they said everyone to his fellows, come and let us cast lots. It's kind of like drawing straws. That we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. And they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. God allowed them to be successful in doing that so they would know who was responsible. And you know, a lot of times there's turmoil and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And everybody will say, well, what's going on uh, 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 in that group of people that they're having all this going on and having all that going on? Let's find out who's in on it. Well, God will reveal that. And he may be dealing with your heartstrings right now saying, I love you, but you're not doing what I have asked you to do. And I'm going to keep getting your attention until you do obey me. Remember Jesus said that obeying God was more important than all the money and sacrifices and burnt offerings and all that in the world. He said he would rather that you listen and that you obey him than all of the good works you can possibly do. God is more pleased with your obedience. That is what is called living a holy life. When you obey him that will all kick in. You'll know exactly how to conduct yourself. And so they said to Jonah, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is this evil come upon us? What's your occupation? Where did you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear Jehovah God. The Lord of the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid when they found out that the true and genuine living God was in on this. And they said, why have you done this? For the men knew he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And they said unto them, what shall we do unto you that the sea may be calm? For the sea wrought and was, I love the old English, and was tempestuous. That means that boat was going up and down. And he told them this. He had one moment of unselfishness. He said, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. And the sea will be calm. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Throw me into the sea. For I'm, I mean, he'd gotten to the point where he was finally humbled. 
And he said, you know what? I'm worthless without God. Look at me. Look at the trouble that I have caused everybody because I will not obey God because I want to do something my way and not the Bible way, not God's way or the leading of the Holy Spirit. I want to do it the way I want to do it. And the longer you keep doing that, the worse it's going to get. Till finally he gets to the point, he said, throw me into the sea. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. And again, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. And so just as they did what they were asked to do, they cried unto the Lord. And they said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood for thou, O Lord, has done as it pleased thee. And so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea and the sea stopped raging. Then the men feared the Lord. God can take your stupidity sometimes to bring others to him. What a terrible thing, though, to be used as an example of what not to be, what not to do. I remember the pastor, Bob Harrington, back in the 70s. Some of you know who I'm talking about and some of you don't. He was the chaplain of Bourbon Street, New Orleans. He was an evangelist that would go on the street and he led thousands to the Lord preaching down in the middle of the, one of the most wicked cities in the world in New Orleans and down on Bourbon Street, which is the worst of them. And later on in years, he got his eyes off of God and got it on the wrong things and he walked away from the ministry. And he wound up being a contestant normally on a game show and was a joke. Until finally, one night in an old hotel, he was contemplating suicide because he had thrown his life completely away. And the Lord spoke to another pastor and said, go find him and stop him with what he's getting ready to do. And they did. And he did get back on his feet again. But his message that he preached was a different one in his remaining years, he would come to a church and he'd go, don't be what I was. Don't turn out like I did. I'm an example of what you should not do. And what a terrible thing for that to be your testimony. But it could be if you don't listen. And so the men feared the Lord the real Lord, exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and they made vows. And when they had thrown Jonah overboard, it said the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Even when you are running from God, he is setting things up to get your attention. He had already prepared that fish because, of course, he knew they were going to throw Jonah overboard. And that thing was going to swallow Jonah. And he was going to take a ride that he would never forget. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Can you imagine how nasty, slimy, and stinking that was in the belly of a fish for three days? Now, if that don't get you right with God, I don't know what will. But sometimes God has to do these things to get our attention. And each person is different. And he knows what it takes to push your buttons and to get your attention. And if you don't listen, then he's going to push another one. Why? Because the Bible said if you are saved, you are bought with a price. The blood of Jesus, and he's not going to let you slide. He's going to keep on getting your attention until he has to take you off this earth. Listen while you can. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And he, and he said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardst my voice. Maybe you feel like this morning that you're in the belly of hell. 
Maybe you're saying, well, you know, it can't get any worse. Please don't ever say that out loud. Because it can. And it will if you don't listen. But God always allows you to turn it around. And here's your chance today, people, if you're listening, to make it right and do what he says to do. And I, I'm going to tell you, it's a tough thing because you've got to give up your will. Man, I had all kinds of really cool jobs before I surrendered to the ministry full time. That's what he wanted me to do. He may want you to do something else. But I tried all of these different careers. I did all kinds of things. At one time in the late 70s, I was doing laboratory calculations for the milk that you drank. That's why some of y'all look like mutants in here this morning. <laughs> I was a chemist for a dairy reading viruses and bacteria and mixing up formulas and putting additives in dairy products. Oh yeah, that's scary, ain't it? That's real scary. But that's not where God wanted me. Then I went into law enforcement for 14 years. Man, they had to darn near wedge that badge out of my hand when I finally said, all right, God, I'll do it, and I quit. But now I'm so glad that I'm doing what he told me to do. Has it been the toughest thing of my life? Yeah, it has. A whole lot more stressful than any of the other things I've ever done. But I have victory with it. Amen. I have victory. And so he said, out of the belly of hell cried I. And then at the end of chapter 2 and verse 9, he said... After he made his prayer, he said, I will sacrifice unto thee the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. That's what you need to do this morning. Some of you have promised God and said, yes, I'll do this, God. I, I will accept this calling, God. I will do what you ask me. But you didn't do it. And he finally said, I will pay what I have vowed. For salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish and had vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now here's Jonah carried all the way to Nineveh in the belly of a fish. And the thing puked him up on the bank. You know, it's hard to say puke on TV, I think. I just did. So the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. And here it is again. Sometimes God will repeat it. Once he's got your attention and you're ready and willing to listen, he said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I told you to preach. You do what I told you to do. See, here's the big picture. It's all about souls. We're nothing more special than anybody else. We're all part of the body of Christ and he will call you to win souls and he'll call her to win souls and in the way that he wants you to do it, he is all about building the kingdom of God. And he said, you do it the way I told you to do it. And so Jonah rose. And he went into the city according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a, an exceedingly great city of three days journey. That's old English for 60 miles wide. The city was 60 miles wide. That's a long city. Big city. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. He went 20 miles into the city. And here's his sermon. Boy, this one is such one of them uplifting sermons so good. It'll pack the house out every time and people will be dancing in the aisles. Here's his sermon. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Wow. But that's what God told him to preach. He told him to say that. He didn't get up there and grin and go, buy my book. Today is your best day ever. Your, this is your best life ever. I'm going to tell you something. The older you get, the more you hope Joel Osteen is wrong. <laughs> this is not your best life ever. 
I, it's like he was saying, where has the time gone? Man, every, every morning I, I get step out the shower into a full-length mirror. And I look like a drowned rat. And once in a while I'll say out loud, oh my gosh, Donna's one brave woman. And she'll go, what was that, honey? And I go, I don't want nothing, I'm just talking her loud. <laughs> Time flies, buddy. And the older you get, it will not be your best life ever. That's not true. Now, he begins, his sermon is going to be one of judgment. And he goes into 20 miles and he says, yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. And listen to this. The people of Nineveh believe God. You want your ministry to work? Then obey and do it God's way. How many times have I thought of something that was really noble, it worked good on paper, I thought would be a great ministry, and it flopped. And I couldn't understand why it flopped. And the reason why God showed me is because I didn't do it His way. I didn't do what He told me to do. You can be of the most mediocre talent in the world, but if you do it God's way, it will be successful and it'll work and people will be reached. The people of Nineveh, as wicked and evil as they were, because Jonah obeyed. Here was a, a, a city of, 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 oh my goodness, four or five hundred thousand people and the people believed God and they proclaimed a fast. That meant they were serious. And, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. I remember one time when I went to a Promise Keepers rally. In Washington, D.C., over one and a half million men showed up to get on their face before God and pray. And it revolutionized my life when I was part of that. And as we drove into D.C., there was a group of pastors holding up signs about repenting. And they were all wearing sackcloth. I'll never forget that as long as I live. What an amazing sight. And so the people declared a fast. And they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And the word came unto the king of Nineveh. Man, let me tell you something. Wouldn't it look great from the lowest in America all the way up to the president's office if everyone proclaimed a fast and they repented of their sins and they put on sackcloth and they would sit in ashes and cry unto the Lord, God would turn this world upside down. But he did it in Nineveh because one person obeyed God and said, all right, I'll do it. Now listen. The word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. That's the king. The king never does that. But this time he did because he believed the word of God that was being preached by a reluctant but obedient servant. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed, not, let them not drink water, but let man and beast. They even put sackcloth on the animals. They did. And let them be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let every man turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hand. After they heard the message, they started sharing it with everyone else. And they said, who, who can tell if God will turn away from it and uh, from his fierce anger that we don't die? And God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way, and God turned it around, repented of the evil that he had said that would do unto them, and he did it not. History tells us that God spared Nineveh for a number of years, not days, but years. Eventually, they went back into sin years later and were utterly 
destroyed and never resurrected again their city leveled to the ground but they were spared for that number of years because a revival was brought to that land by one person that had a simple message yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown he did what God told him to do see here's the thing you don't have to think of some clever way to do your ministry or, or you don't have to, to sit and, and get it all figured out you obey God and do what he tells you to do and he will give the increase he will ma make the way ready for you no matter what it is that you have to do but here's the problem you can't try it one week and go do your thing the next week no, it's not going to happen it's either all or nothing with God you have to never look back never look back when you start walking his way you have to make your body and your life a sacrifice to him your wants and wishes have to be put on the back burner and you do what his are you obey him and I kid you not you'll never have a bored minute in your life you never will it will be tough at times and it'll be heartbreak at times but it's, it's wonderful to you, you I kid you not of all the things I've accomplished in my life there is nothing like hearing somebody say my life was changed because of what you said to me and I gave my life to the Lord I'd rather hear that than to have all of Bill Gates's money I mean that there ain't nothing like seeing people grow in the Lord and their lives change and all that and you can do that too you can be part of that too no matter what he calls you to do no matter how small it may be or how big it may be if you obey him and you know most of you in your heart knows what God wants you to do he knows the sins and you know the sins that you need to walk away from in order to give your life to him completely and the distractions and the things that you're doing that are wrong if you will stick your neck out for God and say, I'll do it no matter what the cost, you'll be floored by the way he turns your life around and gives you real direction and allows you to reach more and more people. I'm not talking about a time of preparation for anybody. He, Jesus never told any of his disciples I will use you after you get your doctorate. <laughs> Chances are he can't use you after you get your doctorate. Yeah. In some cemeteries, I mean seminaries. Yeah. <laughs> he wants you to surrender right now. Not tomorrow, not Tuesday, not to go home and think about it. You got to trust him. Really trust him. And say, Lord, it doesn't make any difference what you do with me. Here I am. And don't ever look back. Don't ever question it. Do exactly what he tells you to do. Be willing. And if you don't know exactly what to do, you make yourself available and surrender. And he'll show you what you need to do. First of all, if you've never truly trusted Christ as your Savior, that's the number one thing he wants you to do. He can't do anything with you till you do that. We're going to have some folks standing down here in just a moment that will take a Bible and pray with you and hug you or whatever and tell you how to become a Christian. It's very simple. It's a matter of trusting him as your Savior. They'll pray with you.